We come again to the Gospel of John and the 10th chapter, and John chapter 10 is a record of the response of Jesus and the Pharisees to the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. Jesus healed a man born blind by making mud out of the dirt of the ground and applying it to his eyes and having him go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he came back seeing and everybody was amazed and even the comment was made which is true today is that there is no cure for anybody born blind. Uh, only God and his healing power may do that. And so in the middle of John chapter 10, the uh, festival or the feast of dedication is going on, which is like a national day of cleaning and repair of the temple, and eventually that became our modern holiday of Hanukkah for the Jewish people. And so we know that it is in winter, and we know that in fact it can get cold in Israel. And Jesus is teaching in one of the hallways and one of the colonnades of the temple, and they are throwing questions at him, and they are trying to trap him, and they said, tell us plainly, if you are the Christ, if you are the one anointed of God, if you are the one sent of God, tell us plainly that you are this guy, and then we will listen to you. And in John 10, 30, uh, Jesus decides to take them up on their offer, uh, and he answers plainly and says, I and the Father are one. Uh, this was not a happy thing for the Pharisees to hear because it says that they immediately picked up stones to stone him, that what he has said was so offensive that the only response for Jesus Christ was death. And Jesus says, well, what are the works that I did? Are you stoning me for? And as a reversal of, of ideas, they now say, we're not stoning you for any of the works you did. Well, in the last chapter, they were going to stone him for the works he did. Now they're saying, no, 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 the works you did are fine. It's the words you said, not the things you did, but the things you said because you made yourself equal with God. And for that is blasphemy and we are going to stone you for blasphemy. And if you read through the Old Testament, especially in Deuteronomy, uh, one of the only death penalties that there was back in those days uh, was blasphemy. Uh, we hear that word thrown around a lot. You hear it on TV. Uh, a lot of the other religions uh, accuse us of blasphemy. And so very quickly, uh, what is blasphemy? Uh, blasphemy is an old word, and it means degrading God or elevating humans. So God has certain attributes. God is a certain way. And one of the things, for example, that God has and is, is he is absolute truth. And so if I say that God lies, and I believe that with all my heart, that would be degrading God. That would be saying something about God's attributes that is not true. That is blasphemy. What Jesus ran into is he elevated himself. So if I said, I never lie just like God, or I'm perfect just like God, that would be blasphemy because I'm elevating myself up. And that's what they thought Jesus was doing. They thought Jesus was elevating himself, not bringing God down to his level. There is another word that is thrown around today, and that is heresy. And heresy simply means contradictory scripture, uh, usually the plan of salvation or the purposes and plans of God. So if I say all religions lead to eternal life and lead to heaven, that would be heresy because it goes against scripture. I'm not really degrading God with that statement. I'm not elevating myself. I'm presenting a false truth from scripture. And so as you hear these words in scripture, you just kind of need to know what the Pharisees are talking about and what they mean. And they didn't like the fact that Jesus Christ was elevating himself. He said, I and the Father are one. Now, when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, uh, there's still much debate today. 
But as I said, that they picked up stones to stone this blasphemer, Jesus Christ. Many people look at this statement and in an attempt to water down who Jesus Christ is, they will say, oh, well, he's just saying that he is of one will or one mind with the Father. In other words, he's very obedient, uh, which is true, that he is also one in purpose with God the Father, that everything he did was something that God the Father wanted him to do. And in that way, it is also true. But the Pharisees clearly didn't believe that because if he was just saying, I am very obedient or I always follow scripture, they would pat him on the back and say, good job. And you don't stone people for being obedient. But the word that is used uh, for one and the idea that he is um, presenting is that he and God the Father are of the same essence. Now, this is kind of tricky because we do not understand how this is pulled off. We do not understand God's essence. And if I try to explain it too detailed, I will go into the area of blasphemy because I will be degrading God by bringing him down to my level. But consider this, you are made up of something. We can say that as humans, we are made up of flesh and bones and water and blood and some electricity in our brain and various chemicals and you put it all together and you get people and you can see some commonalities between the stuff that makes us up and, and various mammals and then fish are kind of made up of the same basic sort of thing and if you get down to the root of it we are all made up of molecules and atoms and now they're talking about subatomic particles and if you take apart people you can find out chemically exactly what the essence of us is and many people have done that and through that they have kind of removed the soul or the spirit from people because that can't be quantitative now if you could do the same thing to God which you cannot but if you could do the same thing with God and take him apart and find out what he's made of and and what God's stuff is in there and and what is the core of God what Jesus is saying is if you dissect God the Father and find the core of what is in there, that same core is in Jesus Christ. The God stuff that makes God God is also in Jesus Christ. Now Jesus is not saying he is God the Father. We believe in something called the Trinity. The Trinity means that we are monotheists. We believe in one God, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all made of the same God stuff, but they are different in function. They are different in personality. People have tried to draw the Trinity. Uh, this is one of the most accurate, if you will. The Father is God, the Spirit is God, the Son is God, but the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son. Uh, when you get to heaven and you meet God face to face, then perhaps you can have a discussion and maybe he can explain how this all works. But in the meantime, it is faith. And when Jesus Christ said, I and the Father are one, the Pharisees clearly understood that he was calling himself God, that he was calling himself the Son of God, because they picked up rocks and stones from the repair work and were going to kill him right there in the temple, which would have made the Romans kind of upset because they didn't like riots like that. But Jesus was able to talk to them about it. And we will look in a bit about what he said. The first thing, which is a kind of change of, of, of pattern, is that the Pharisees said, uh, we now approve of your miracles. They didn't approve of him healing a man born blind because he did it on Saturday. 
on the holy day of the Sabbath. And because the Jews were very legalistic about what things were done when, Jesus purposefully did these miracles to kind of poke at the Pharisees to show them their hypocrisy. But now they're saying, no, 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 no. All the healings, the feeding of the 5,000, all that kind of stuff, it's okay. Those we agree with, we disagree with your words. And Jesus, in response to their criticism of him, quotes Psalm 82.6. Psalm 82.6, the part he's saying, he says, I said you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, what is Psalm 82.6? Is Psalm 82.6 blasphemy? Uh, no, it's not. It is the Word of God. Psalm 82 was written about the judges of Israel. If you think back to Moses, Moses pulls the people out of Egypt. They're now at Mount Sinai, and there's a million and a half of them, a big group of people. And it's too much for Moses to handle. And people would come to him saying, this person stole my ox. And another person saying, this person let their ox run onto my property. And they wanted Moses to handle all of these civil judicial cases. And Moses' stepfather, Jethro, said, no, why don't you get godly people who know how to judge and put them over smaller groups, over hundreds and over thousands and over ten thousands so that if somebody has a problem with a runaway ox they can talk to the local magistrate and they only come to Moses with things about the law. And these people were called judges and that was the start of the judging system in Israel and as they took the promised land and Joshua conquered the cities and you have uh, Genesis, Exodus, Ephesians, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. You have the Book of Judges, and the Book of Judges is a 300-year period in which Israel had no king, and God sent individuals like Gideon and Deborah and Samson and people that great children's stories are made of. These were judges. These were people sent by God to do things on God's behalf. And if you look at how judges are described in the Old Testament, there are certain attributes that they had. First, they had God's authority. When Gideon went and tore down the totem poles and tore down the high places, as it said, everybody got upset and he explained that he did it because an angel of the Lord told him to do it. In other words, Gideon was tearing down false religions because he had God's authority. Samson killed Philistines because he had God's authority. Deborah put a, a tent peg in somebody's head because she had God's authority. All these people were acting for the most part. Samson got a bit off center, but for the most part they were acting with God's authority. Second, they did God's work. Uh, Gideon would never have come up with this on his own. He never would have uh, attacked the Midianites with an army of 300 on his own. Uh, God gave him the work. They spoke God's words. The judges, like the prophets to come, would pronounce judgment, and the judgments were not their own. They were God's. And they were consecrated by God. The Old Testament says that the judges of Israel... And the judge system continued until Israel got a king. And then when Saul became a king, he put in his own law system. And the judge system stopped uh, with Samuel. Samuel was basically the last judge and the first prophet. And so look at this list and go, huh, is there anybody else in the Bible that maybe fits this list, uh, these four things specifically, uh, and the answer would be Jesus. Jesus has God's authority. Jesus did and does God's work. 
Jesus spoke and speaks the words of God, and Jesus is consecrated by God. And so what Jesus is telling these people, these Pharisees, who don't like the fact that he called himself God, is he's saying, if Psalm 82 can call judges gods and sons of gods, lowercase g, then Jesus Christ, who is all these things and more, can also call himself God. And when he's talking, I'm not sure that he was clear at this point whether it was lowercase or uppercase g. He was just saying God. He was probably saying uh, Adonai is the word he was probably using. And in the midst of this, Jesus gives a very profound statement. He says that scripture cannot be broken. Uh, the scripture, even back to Psalm 82, uh, which supports his position, uh, is true. And if you look at the Bible, and a lot of people today will treat the Bible like a smorgasbord. They will take this and leave that alone and take that and leave this alone. But Jesus himself believed in Adam and Eve. Jesus believed in Jonah and the big fish. Jesus believed in Noah's flood. And Jesus believed in Moses. And so all these fanciful things like the story of Jonah, uh, Jesus Christ actually used it as an image of himself because Jonah spent three days in the big fish and Jesus was going to spend three days in the tomb. And so Jesus is telling the Pharisees that if what's good for the goose is good for the gander, if they're going to use scripture to condemn him, he is allowed to use scripture to support him. And that is what he's doing. Jesus is calling himself, in this case, a judge. And since Old Testament poetry called judges gods with little g and sons of gods with little g, Jesus is saying he's one of those, therefore they are not allowed to stone him. But if you look at what Jesus says, if the Bible is always true, and it calls judges gods, and Jesus is consecrated like a judge, and the Pharisees accept his mirac miracles now, and the miracles were the Father's work, then Jesus is saying, why can't I call myself the Son of God? This confuses them. Because in the next passage, they seek to arrest him. So clearly, Jesus' verbal jujitsu has gotten them to the point where they've dropped all the rocks. The people who are there are now so confused by this proper and good logic that they want to arrest him. And what that means is they're going to take him back to the high priest and let the high priest, who was the Bible scholar in the group, let him figure it all out because they don't want to get, you know, they're all foggy and confused now. And so what we have done is we now take the Son of God with a capital S and a capital G because we've read the end of the story. And knowing the end of the story, we know that Jesus Christ is in fact the same God stuff as God the Father, that when we get to heaven... And we stand before God the Father. Jesus Christ is going to be right there. And Jesus Christ is going to be there for all eternity. And the Holy Spirit is going to be right there. And the Holy Spirit is going to be there for all eternity. And so Jesus Christ has answered plainly. He has said that he is God. He is eternal God. He is the same stuff as God the Father. And so, what does that mean for us? The conclusions for the passage is that we can have knowledge of God the Father and Jesus Christ because He is God. If Jesus is talking about God, if Jesus is talking about what God is doing, it is honest and true because Jesus is God. He knows the experience. He knows who God is. Number two, and it's a biggie, is that we have forgiveness of sins because his death had infinite merit 
for atonement. When we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, some may ask, how can he take on all the sins of everybody in the world of all time? Well, he can do it because spiritually Jesus Christ is infinite. He was a human body that died, but he was still God in there. And God can handle infinite everything, infinite number of sins, if you will. Number three, we have victory over circumstances because he lived above circumstances. That's why when we have a difficult time, we can pray and we can get insight and we can get direction and we can get peace because Jesus Christ went through a lot more than most of us. Jesus Christ was hated by his people. Jesus Christ, how would you like to come to church every Sunday and have people argue with you about Jesus Christ and whether you're saved or not, but that seemed to be his thing. Every time he showed up at the temple, he couldn't worship, he couldn't spend time alone with God, he didn't even have time to pray in the temple because they were always arguing with him and always pushing him and every once in a while picking up stones to kill him. And last, we triumph over death in him because he conquered death, because Jesus Christ is God, the tomb could not hold him, and Jesus Christ lives today, and we will see him, and we will meet him, and he is our Savior for all eternity, because he is God. Now the passage, as I said, said they tried to arrest him, but it says he snuck away. How could Jesus sneak away? Well, we've already covered that. He's God, and God can sneak away if God wants to sneak away. But he moved away from them, and he moved across the Jordan to where John the Baptist was. That's about 35, 40 miles away. And your Pharisees that are hanging out in the temple, that was just too far. They're not going to chase after Jesus 35 miles away. And so they, out of sight, out of mind, they basically leave him alone. And several months will go by, and then he will come back to Bethany outside of Jerusalem, and Lazarus will have died. And the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which is the seventh and last miracle of Jesus to prove he is God, uh, starts things in motion which end up in the cross. And so next week, it is John chapter 11. Uh, Jesus Christ has, in this passage, given the clearest statement that he is divinity, has given the plainest statement that he is God incarnate. And so anybody who doubts or who says those infamous words that Jesus Christ never claimed to be God, didn't never read John 10. Uh, in John 10, he makes a very clear statement that he is God, that he is eternal God, that he is the Son of God, and that just upset the Pharisees so much that they were unable to stand it. And their conclusion was, kill him. Uh, today, people have the view of ignore him, but Jesus Christ will not be ignored. As we have said in previous Sundays, everybody will stand before Jesus Christ someday, somehow. Uh, whether it be soon or far off, eventually, God is going to set up a throne and Jesus is going to sit on it and he is going to meet everybody face to face and eternity will be decided. It is important that we be on the right side of Jesus Christ today because he is God and he can do these judgments. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we just praise you for your son. We praise you that he came and died on the cross that we may have eternal life. We praise you that by accepting Jesus Christ, we know that our sins are forgiven, that we are on the right side of God the Father, and that the statement, the Father is in Him and He is in the Father, is true for all eternity. And we praise you for sending your Son that even though he is God, he walked the earth to be with us, to be hungry, to be dirty, and to die for us that we may have eternal life. Lord, we praise you for this and ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day. We ask this through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.